Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. This is episode 34 of our podcast, and welcome to it. We are so excited to just have a conversation with a lovely young man who actually contacted me and asked for the opportunity to share what his life is like. And we're going to get to Ryan in, in just a moment. So Ryan, just, just hang with us for a second. I just want to say hello to our listeners. If you're new to our podcast, you're here. So you obviously found us, but we're schizophrenia, three moms in the trenches. And uh, you can stay in touch with what we're doing by heading to our Facebook page, by subscribing to our podcast, by uh, downloading other episodes, and you can find all the links on our Facebook page. Or there's a page on uh, benbehindhisvoices.com. You can click on podcasts and we have a little entry there. So uh, welcome. I want to thank Corey from Facebook who commented and just said, I'm so grateful I came across your podcast. I feel lost a lot of times with my son's diagnosis. I feel like every episode has given me some hope. So we are just thrilled about that. And also from Nicole in Facebook, who says your life, your podcast has been life-saving for me. Nicole has four special needs kids to have schizoaffective and one bipolar with psychosis. And she's got a lot on her plate. The family has a lot on their plate. It's not just the mom. And she says, because of your podcast, I've been able to find resources I wouldn't have known about otherwise and able to fight hard for my girls armed with information and facts. So thank you. That just, that just makes our day, our episode 33 has had over 400 downloads just in a week. And that's a lot of people finding out about housing information. So we're just glad to be here and be able to tell sides of the story. And tonight I want to share by saying I, I got an email, which I shared with my, my, um, friends in the trenches, Mimi and Mindy, a young man, Ryan wrote to me saying that, and I'll just uh, read a little bit of the email, just a tiny bit. I'm a student and full-time worker living with schizophrenia. And if you want to pick my brain, I'm open. And I am so glad because we've been talking for a year about having our own sons on the podcast, but mine isn't willing and doesn't want to tell his side of the story. So this opportunity just warmed my heart. Ryan said, I, I really appreciated your perspective in your podcast. How I think about my illness rarely leaves my own world and thinking about how it affects my siblings and mom and dad is an interesting dynamic. And that meant a lot to me to hear that. So by the way, Ryan has a master's degree and a job. And he will not be on camera and we are not revealing his last name, but applaud his courage to come out. So out of respect for privacy, all you'll see if you're on YouTube is his first name and, and no camera. And Ryan, just welcome. We're so, three moms are really glad you're here. Uh, we, thank are. You. we are. We definitely are. Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, I came across your podcast by typing in schizophrenia in the uh, the podcast search bar, um, trying to find out more about my illness and trying to uh, get some support. And it was fantastic hearing a mom's perspective other than my mom. Um, my mom <laughs> is an a uh, absolute sweetheart, but uh, hearing it in times four um, adds a little bit of weight. Um, a lot, a lot of weight, actually. Um, so I appreciate you guys having me on the podcast today. And yeah, I'm hoping with any questions you have. That's awesome. I, I just want to start by giving you the opportunity, you know, as, as we said on the phone, because Ryan and I had a, had a phone conversation as, as I said, my, you know, my son who 
his real name is not revealed, but we call him Ben because that's a name he chose for himself when he knew I was writing a book. And my book is totally from my perspective. My son's perspective is only shown in in the poetry that he writes. So I include his poetry. And otherwise, anyone who tells the story, we're telling it from our own perspective. So he is not ready to talk about his diagnosis. He doesn't call it an illness. He doesn't agree that he has it, but he calls it a diagnosis. And he's aware that we all think he has this. And right now he's, he's doing well, maybe not quite as well as you with a master's degree, but he's, he's, he's doing well and he has a good relationship with the family. And so I would love the chance to ask you the things I can't ask my son. And the first question, I just, if you would just, you know, start by just tell us your story. Um, we have about 45 minutes total. So um, I'd like to know a little bit, just give us a background on your family. And then just like when your symptoms started, like when your life began to change. And we'll just jump in with questions if we have them. Um, my mom, I have a mother, a father, um, a brother and sister. Uh very, very talented brother and sister um, who continue to give me inspiration and support. Um, uh, a mom who is kind of like my drill sergeant. Um, <laughs> but I, I absolutely, I don't tell her all the time and it doesn't always come across, but I appreciate the living. I, lo- I love her a lot and I appreciate her a lot. Um, and my dad, uh, he has a little softer approach, um, but he encourages me in a very fatherly way. And I always appreciate his, um, his openness with going down rabbit holes with me and helping me find my way out. Has it always been like that? Or did you guys have a, a, a journey to get to this place of support? Like, Tell us a bit about what happened to you from your perspective. So it's so hard because I had, uh, I think it's anosognosia. Mm -hmm. Um, So not being aware of my illness, everything is kind of post me looking back. And it doesn't serve me uh, well looking back because there's a lot of pain and delusion in my past. And when I explore those places, I find a lot of pain and delusion. Um, but I can tell you uh, my sophomore year of college, um, I started to feel different. I didn't know what I will. I took, I took acid and I came out of that acid trip feeling different. Like I was never going to be the same. And I don't think that I ever was. Um, So going into my junior year of college, it was a steady decrease. uh, Lots of drugs, uh, Xanax, Adderall, acid. Um, And I, looking back now, I feel as if I was in a lot of suffering Um, I was in a lot of pain as much as I wasn't aware of it. And, um, I was trying to escape. Um, I had a girlfriend that had cheated on me and that, um, caused a lot of pain. Um, but I wasn't aware of it. I just knew I had to escape and I went through it in very bad ways. I wasn't a great influence on my friends. Um, I was a bad son to my mother. Um, I used a lot of her money to fuel my drug habits. Um, But I try to look at it through the frame of I was sick and being diagnosed with schizophrenia um, was my second chance at life in a very, very weird way. Say more about that. What, so you feel like college was more, 
Do you, th do you think partly the drug use was trying to escape from some symptoms of schizophrenia that were, that were starting to develop in you? It, you know, Russell Brandt says, uh, you know, uh, drugs weren't my problem. Reality was my problem. Drugs were my solution. And so was something happening in your reality in terms of maybe having some hallucinations or just having some psychosis or did your, you said you didn't feel the same ever. So did your brain feel different and you were hoping the drugs would fix it? Can you, I feel like I was, awareness? A, I feel like I was, um, I was experiencing paranoia uh, and was unwilling to recognize it, face it. And um, paranoia can be a deep, dark uh, road, especially if you're not aware of it. Um, so it led up to the first hospitalization, hospitalization where I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I didn't believe it. I was just standing there like, everything's fine. Like, I'll be good. <laughs> Like, this is just a bump in the road. Um, but then the hallucinations persisted, the voices persisted, um, the delusions persisted, and the paranoia persisted. So how long uh, were, was that hospitalization? And you know, like, did you go on meds at that time? Or like, what, would, what do you recall was happening in your head? Uh, it was voluntary. Okay. Um, I chose to go to the hospital because I threat, um, threatened to take my own life and my friend's life. Um, and I knew enough to say, I, I don't know if it was command voices. I, I'm not sure. Um, but I knew enough. I actually, I wanted to stay. Um, I called my parents. I was like, you have to come pick me up now. And then I was like, no, don't pick me up. I'm fine. I'll figure it out. Pick you and, up from the hospital or from Oh, I college? apologize. Uh, from college. Okay. No, that's okay. We just, if, if I don't understand, I'll just ask you. Um, from, from college then. Okay. From college. And then uh, after that, they came, they, well, they came, they picked me up and they were like, Ryan, like, you need to get help. And like, I was in the car being like, I'm special. I'm not special. I'm gifted. I'm not gifted. And they were like, now looking back, they're probably like, the, he's psychotic. In my head, I was still trying to figure stuff out. Hmm. I'm curious, uh, Ryan, about your friends. Um, you mentioned, I think you said you were using um, drugs with them. And then later you were said part of your delusion was to harm them. And I'm wondering in your hindsight, now that you're, you obviously are doing really well right now in your hindsight, um, could you, do you have any insight into your friends? Were they um, aware that you had delusions to harm them? Were they aware that drugs meant more to you than it did to them because you were having also your symptoms mm -hmm. of schizophrenia or do you have any insight into that that you could share uh i i do want to say that my best friend during that time uh is still my best friend and that's amazing that doesn't always happen <laughs> he's been my best friend since i was five and that support that love to be able to say i want to hurt you and then for them to still be there is mm -hmm. the most incredible I don't think there's a greater love on earth, honestly. Yeah. Wow. Uh, That's fantastic. That probably helps with your recovery. What do you think? Yeah. And like during, just to go back for a sec, uh, during the time they weren't aware, but I was hiding my facial expressions. I was not telling people what I thought. So there was no way they could have known because I couldn't materialize and I was hiding. Um, so I don't, I did blame them for a bit, um, but I don't anymore. And it hurts more to blame them. Okay. Sorry. There's a lot of insight you have looking back clearly. Can you bring us back to that voluntary hospitalization? Like what, 
because I know, I know in my son's case, he's never gone voluntarily. It's always been, and he's been hospitalized nine times, 10, nine, whatever. Um, it, it was never his choice. And, but it was to his benefit to, you know, to get treatment. And <clears throat> at the moment he's, that's adding to his stability. But for you, you said you went voluntarily. So can you remember, and it must be really hard to revisit it. So just, you know, tell us whatever you're willing to tell us. You said your thoughts were to harm yourself and possibly harm your friend. And obviously that woke you up enough to, to go. So did you call the hospital yourself or like, how did you get to the hospital? And once you were there, were you willing, obviously you had some detoxing to do, but did, were you willing to go on medication? Like what was that journey like for you in your recollection? And what did it feel like in your head? That's a lot of questions I know. So. No, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to touch on them all, but I I'd probably, you'll have to remind me. That's something my mom does really well. Too. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I called because, yeah, I, I knew I was, I knew I was, something was wrong. That's why I called my mom and I was crying. I actually called her crying saying, I want to kill myself, mom. And then I sat in my friend Chris's arms for like 30 minutes and just like cried and puked. It felt like I was having an exorcism. Um, and my friend Ryan was sitting on the bed and he looked really depressed and I wanted to save him, but I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to save myself. Um, and I, with my hindsight, you can't save someone from depression. Like, but that, that was what was going through my head. And I, when I got to the hospital, the doctor said, um like do you want to hurt yourself and I said yes and but I I feel like I didn't like mean it okay like I I wanted to hurt myself but I like I knew I was never going to go through with it like I was suffering but I knew enough not to hurt myself or anyone else but the thoughts did you were want to did you want to hurt yourself or did you think you had to hurt yourself the reason I ask that is because part of my son's delusion is command voices that you mentioned earlier he thinks he has to and he's had delusions that he has to kill me or he has to uh, burn himself or you know things like that but he doesn't want to he just his delusion makes him think he has to, but he distinguishes between having to and wanting to. Do you have that kind of a nuance or not with your, uh, when you said you wanted to kill yourself? Um, just to touch on the command voices a little bit. Um, the, the, the way it sounds weird, but the way I best deal with uh, command voices when I do have them is to disassociate from my mind. It's the only way I can get through it. Can um, you say more what what that how how that works? Dis it just it feels like my breathing slows down, and I try to not think and detach my mind. It's like I just go into like this trance of like it's my body being like, okay, like this is really scary. Just zone out and like slow your breath down and like get, get out of your head. And I do think a lot of that has to do with paranoia. Um, it's, I feel like um, when you're paranoid, you get a uh, fight or flight response mm -hmm. and you get like, in my experience anyways, you get one chance a day to like fight your paranoia. And if you miss it, you're retreating the rest of the day. 
So if you keep trying to fight and retreat, fight and retreat, fight and retreat, you end up cornering yourself in this like really dark place in your mind where the voices are just surrounding you and there's no way out. And that's when the voices feel like they get to command voices because it's just like, please voices get out of my head. Uh, you still have voices or do you, does your medicine um, pretty much silence them? Um, my, my, uh, so I just went down on my medication and for all the schizophren- schizophrenics listening out there, take your meds. <laughs> <laughs> we like that advice as mother. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, don't smoke weed. Um, and uh, practice mindfulness. The rest is on you guys. Um, I can't really give more than that. Those are really three great tips. I, I would imagine you had quite a journey to get from I'm in the hospital to where yeah. you are today. So can you can you kind of tell us like, and this is it's so helpful. Thank you, Ryan. And thanks again for your courage. Can you tell us a bit about like how many hospitalizations have you had? Have you ever cheeked your med? Oh, how many hospitalizations yeah. have you had? Oh, uh, I've had uh, I've had two uh, two voluntary hospitalizations. Okay, and were they for a good length of time or just like seven or eight days? Um, for uh, seven or yeah, seven days both times. Okay, so it was short and. And so I know you're currently on medication. You've shared that. Have you ever tried to go off that medication? And if so, what happens? Uh, all I know is when I went down on my medication, my hallucinations got worse. And I can't imagine a world where they're much worse than they are. Like they're already distracting and I get uh, in a trance sometimes. So I can't really I'm very happy with where I'm at it's enough where I can recognize that I have an illness and then I am hallucinating but um not enough where my hallucinations uh, run my life you said right now you're going down on your meds is that yes. the doctor's recommendation or are you just doing that on your own um I, I breath <laughs> um I I asked I said I feel like I'm in a good place. Um, do you mind if I uh, do you mind if I go down on my medication? And they said, "Yeah." And I medication is really tricky because you want to be aware of your illness enough that you know it's there, but not enough that it controls your life. And I feel like I'm at that now. Oh, that sounds better than just doing it on your own. I'm, that's really good that you're discussing it. Sounds yeah. like had her hand up there. Mimi's had her, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. And this is the thing that always mystifies me is the, the issue and the nature of anosognosia. Now, you sound right now like you have a tremendous amount of insight and you know what's going on and you, you, know, you identify things real clearly. When you mm-hmm. think back to before when you said that you had anosognosia, what does that feel like, the memory? Is it like in some sort of a dream? Do you remember the same things happening but not understanding what was going on? It's something that would be really helpful to understand when we're dealing with our loved ones who have it. Uh, it really, I was medicated right when I uh, went to the hospital the first time. Mm-hmm. And I always knew I had schizophrenia um, from that point, like an understanding, but I didn't feel like I experienced it until I went down on my medication. So you knew you had it because you were informed that you had it or you just knew something was different? Uh, because I was informed. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, my... Like my, I was seeing the devil and like, and like my, the, the great part about reality is that it's shared. 
and um, I was not sharing with other, uh, with the rest, with other people um, in reality. And I knew enough that I had, that I was not, that I had schizophrenia, but I didn't feel like I was experiencing it. So it sounds, and and I know that from our conversation before, and I also would imagine it's a, it's a struggle to, I'm actually so surprised that you've said my diagnosis is schizophrenia, because even on our phone conversation, you weren't so sure you wanted to say that. So thank you for being willing to say that in this, in this podcast, it sounds to me like when when the delusions get stronger or when your thoughts get stronger, you used a different phrase on the phone with me. It wasn't voices, but when, when your thoughts get a little out of control and do, does it feel like it steals you from your real reality of your friends and your family? Does, does it feel isolating, but you also have company because everything going on in your head is about you? Yeah. Um, so, so I know I have to like, I understand when I have to get back to the present and get back to some sense of reality. Um, but yeah, you, you hit it right on the head. I told you like I, um, I uh, hallucinate my subconscious, um, which I, and I, I'm going back up into my head again. But um, I hear the voices of my mom and my brother and my ex-girlfriend and my friends. And sometimes I just hear um, like, a, like, a, like a demonic voice. Um, Is it scary? Yeah. And you hear your mom's voice because our son hears my voice sometimes. And invariably, for some reason, this illness is such a cruel illness. I'm not saying nice things, you know, what he thinks I said. And um, he's gotten to the point where he reality checks with me. He'll say, did you just say you hate me or something like that? And I'm so grateful that he does so I can refute and say, of course, I didn't say that. I would never say that. Do you ever reality check like that? Or, you know, to me, it must be very tiring to have to sort out what somebody really said compared to what inside your head said that they said. And how do you cope with that? Uh, Finding the courage to ask, hey, what did you just say? (laughs) (laughs) Do do that. Wonderful. It so and sometimes I'm so in my head, I'm like, boop, I go to the top. I'm like, I know exactly what you said. <laughs> uh, and I, when I, uh, when I do that, I should um, slow down and uh, apologize and ask for clarification. Takes a, takes a little bit of courage, but um, I'm getting there. Do you ever have a sense of humor about it? Because, you know, every now and then, all of us, when we're on this this program, when we share things that everybody else would think would be horrible, we, we can actually get to laughing about it. And sometimes I do that with my son, too, where, you know, things just seem so funny to us if we're in the right mood. Have you, do you ever find any humor in what you're going through? Uh, occasionally, uh, when I'm in a good routine. And Mm -hmm. I feel, um, I feel like in a groove or like repetitious, I'm like, and like nothing bothers me. And I get like that sometimes. And it feels like the whole world melts around, uh, melts around me. And I can, uh, like my joy starts coming back. My, um, like I can laugh and I can, I can be with the people I love and um, I take that for granted sometimes being in that groove Mm -hmm. but um, I think my mom and 
Um, she's she's incredible and she she'll she'll hit me de- like keep me on the ground and my dad will th- pull up a funny youtube video and um we'll we'll laugh sometimes um honestly i'm still at the point where i'm pretty like even right now like my palms are sweaty i'm like <laughs> i'm sweating i'm not feeling um i get i get uh i get it's not easy Um, so the moments I do find laughter are, uh, moments to cherish for sure. And you're taking a big risk, you know, to be on here and sharing with us. So that could be contributing to your sweaty palms too. But, you know, I, I think it's so admirable that you're talking like this because, you know, people that listen to our podcast will take so much hope from the insights that you have and how rational you're doing and you can, think about your illness and talk about it this way. I think it's gives great hope to um, other families and other people with mental illnesses who are listening to. And what, do, what gives you hope? How do you um, feel hopeful about your future? What helps the most? Uh, two things. One is a shared truth. And the other is that I'm a boss, like I'm a genius. I know that that can get into a realm of uh, delusion, but um, like I have a 4.0 master's degree. I am an, I'm a good son now. Um, and I, I, I do a lot of good things in my life. I pick up a sock every once in a while. I do the dishes, I take out the garbage. Mm-hmm. And, hey. <laughs> uh, and my mom, like we tell each other, we love each other all the time. And the fact that, um, I'm, the fact that, um, that, uh, that we're all, we're all here to share, uh, amazing moments and I'm sorry, I forgot the question. I, what gives you, uh, what gives you, you answered it. Yeah. yeah, what gives you hope? And so I think you did answer that. But um, one of the programs we did, we had someone on who had, um, I think it was schizophrenia too, who um, was doing really well, like you are. And then we heard from someone, a mother, I think, whose daughter wasn't doing so well, and she didn't see that she was ever going to do well. Have you, and hopefully that will change, but have you had a chance to interact either maybe not in the psych ward where you weren't doing well yourself, but other places where you see the spectrum of people doing really well or middling or not so well. And, and do you have any advice or hope for those who aren't doing as well? Uh, you guys are probably gonna hate me for this, but like you're a genius. And I mean that people are always going to treat you like you're different and you are it takes an incredibly strong person to go through what you're going through and it's not going to be easy but god put that on you for a reason and you're strong you're intelligent you one day you'll have the strength to confront your paranoia until then rely on your family, rely on your friends, rely on the people around you. And it's okay to not be okay, but it's okay to be okay too. And one day you'll be okay. I promise. And we'll add to that what you said before, which was take your meds, mindfulness. And there was a third tip that you gave. So how hard is it for you to stay um, away from drugs now? Or is that part of your recovery? Uh, when I went down on the medication, I came a lot of realizations in a short period of time, but um, that I, I hallucinate, like I am weed. Like I don't, I don't need, my, isn't I, my, the brain is, <laughs> The brain is very, uh, it's uh, a constant weed smoker is very similar to someone with schizophrenia. 
and I hallucinate, I don't need, I don't need to hallucinate more. Mm -hmm. um, gotcha. To give you insight into why I did smoke weed though. Um, it doesn't help with my head at all, but it did elevate my feeling. Um, and it's without weed, I get, I get sweaty. Like, I, I feel like, like, I don't, I go back to a place of, it feels like a lack of feeling and weed helped me get out of that. I, I don't, I'm trying my best not to need it. Um, but um, it is tough. But so I know when you say to people, you said earlier, don't smoke weed. What are you basing that on? I don't need to hallucinate more than I hallucinate now. So that you, you've assessed intellectually that smoking weed does not benefit you, but emotionally, sometimes you feel drawn towards it. Yes. I see. And I have a question also. You, um, you said you're still friends with this one friend that you've been friends with since you were a young child. Um, and do you have a social life and friends and people that you've met since you've been diagnosed and moved back into your life? Uh, no, but I, I hope today is the, the, first, the first step towards that. And so tell me if this is uncomfortable and I'll stop, but this is one of the things that just pains me so much about my son is his isolation. And, and so I, I really have a yearning to understand it. So, um, so, you want to have interaction with people, but you do you tend to just s separate yourself or, or you just, I mean, you, you work a job and you work with people, correct? Uh, yeah, I work from home. So everything's over the, uh -huh. over the phone, nice. which makes it a lot easier on me. And um, you live at home with your parents? I, I do. And yeah. you're, you're 25, Ryan, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So it's just, mid twenties, our sons are about a decade past you. So that it, it's good to know. Um, so, you know, I always talk about, and I'm not the only one, but, you know, when I've spoken to health practitioners and families about what, what we find for hope in our family, and I always say, you know, there are four pillars to doing well with this illness, really any illness, it's stuff we all need. And one is treatment, whatever that treatment is for you. Mm -hmm. And one is structure, um, purpose, like having a purpose. You clearly, you, you are a genius. You have a master's degree and you have a job. Um, so job gives you purpose. And I know with my son, when COVID made his job go away, it was really tough. And the fourth thing is love you know, community and love. And it sounds like you've got your family on your side. You've got your most important friends on your side. What, and again, if you're uncomfortable, just say, I'd rather not answer that. And we will just move on. What, when you're trying to make new friends mm -hmm. and an acquaintance is one thing and a coworker is one thing. My son worked in a restaurant for a long time and never told anyone he has schizophrenia. So, and I get that because he didn't need to and he wouldn't have been hired and it's all that. But when you think about having other relationships in your life, maybe one day having a girlfriend and maybe you have one now, I don't know, or, or another close friend at what, at some point do you ever say, look, I, you know, I have this illness and this is what it means. And if you see me gesturing weirdly, I'm just having a moment and I need to go and be mindful or is that going to be part of your journey to self-acceptance, to letting select people know just people close to you know about your illness or a stigma really get in the way of that? Uh, I tell people uh, like on Tinder and Bumble. Yeah. Oh, you're on Tinder. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good for you. Okay. Um, and good for you for telling people on social media. Well, that's, uh, that's, those are dating apps. It's not quite social media. It's more of a private thing, right? Or is oh, it Tinder. Well, that, okay. That uh, dates me because I've, 
didn't quite know what Tinder no, was. It's a, it's a dating app. You swipe left. Oh, right. so you're okay. just telling right. it to a small, to whoever you're interacting to. Interact. to yeah. Right, Ryan, do I have that right? Yeah, in, in, a, in a private uh, private message, I'll say I, I have schizophrenia. Um, so I, I told one person she ran away. I told mm-hmm. another person and she was, I was like, I hallucinate. Um, and that's where I left it at. Cause I was a little afraid cause of the last one. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I make new friends, I don't know if I want new friends, but if I make new friends, I feel like it should be something I tell them when I'm ready. It's tough yeah. cause it's tough because it's part of my identity a little bit. Um, so if you were a nice, like a generous person, you wouldn't hide that. But I have to be selective about who I share part of my identity with. And what is the reason for that? Because of their preconceptions about what having schizophrenia means or because it would scare them away? Uh, scare them away. I think I have a delusion that someone could take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Um, that may not be a delusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. may be a suspicion, <laughs> which <laughs> it's a fine line, I know, but it could be based on truth. There are people who would, and there are many people who don't understand it. So that's why we that's asked. Why I was asking earlier about friends you've met, you know, that also have a mental illness, because, you know, my son is older than you and all his friends have a mental illness. The ones he started out with, he wasn't um, fortunate like you are to have a friend who stuck with him. A couple of them did for a couple of years, you know, but kind of waned because they, their lives uh, changed and they weren't dealing with all the things he was dealing with. So they just didn't have as much in common. But Jim, our son Jim has some really good friends, thing, people he camps with and, and, you know, goes to restaurants or coffee shops is what they really like and bars too and and it's all people like him who have a mental illness it might not be schizophrenia but some other type of mental illness and then they have that connection which they never talk about but they still have that empathy and if Jim ever starts to not feel good and has to go home and mentions that they're fine with that or they cancel at the last minute but you haven't met any people like that yet at your young age, it sounds like. I have one friend who has bipolar and I feel like he like gets me. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably push myself too hard in situations I could be like, I want to go home, but I'm like, I got to show people I'm normal. Um, so that tug and pull. How, how about your siblings? Um, do they... How do they roll with your illness? Uh, my brother is there treats attention you get or resentful or or how does it go? Uh, my brother always I don't want to sound bad, but he always makes sure that I'm listened to and that he is listened to by my family. And um, he has to stick up for himself sometimes, or it would all be about me. Wow. And your sister? My sister is a, a soldier, or she's going to be a soldier. Mm-hmm. And um, she treats life with the occasional, um, occasional laughing, but she treats life um, like a soldier, and she's strong and tough. And if something's bothering her, I, um, she, she'll let me kind of have the way most of the time and just let me be me. Um, but she, she's so brave and so tough and she's a big part of my life. You sound well, like a, a very, very empathetic. Just so we know, we have about five minutes left and two things I really don't want to leave out. One is because I'm wishing for you as you continue to grow in your life that you find, continue to have the love that you have from your family and close friends and that you also have uh, a community of people who get you in in that way. I, I know at the moment, my son, 
he was not very happy when he was your age and he was in a group home and um, in a community of people who had mental health issues. And I think it's because he was 25 and they were all 40, but now he's 39. He doesn't hate, you know, he, he, he is actually enjoying being part of that community, but also has hopes for his future. So I wish for you some community. I think part of the problem with especially schizophrenia and anything with psychosis is it is very isolating. And I, I think that that community, even beyond your family, I hope that that is something that, that you get. Thank so you. I just want to say that. And I know this is your first time because I was assumed that you were out speaking to groups all the time and telling your story. And you said, no, this is my first time. So I want to acknowledge the bravery of taking that step. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I want to know it, if you have, you, you have five minutes left. The question you wanted us to ask our sons, because Mindy did get a chance to ask it. And, uh, and then anything else you want us to know that you want to get across in this podcast because I know you sent me a Venn diagram and I finally understand it because my husband knows what a Venn diagram is. So you, and, and if you want, I can kind of put it in the show notes, but you were trying to explain to me what it feels like to have schizophrenia. And I so appreciated the effort you put into it. And I had to really look at it to try to understand it. So, but this is a podcast. So if you can, you know, maybe tell us what you want us to know and then pose that question and Mindy can answer it, those two parts. Uh, uh, Let's do the question yeah, first. You asked yeah. us to ask our sons a question. And what was that question? Uh, the question was, what do you think about when no one's around? What do you do when you're frustrated? And um, what does a recovery from a mental health breakdown look like to you? So I asked Jim about what does he think about um, when, when no one else is around and he thinks about, I was sorry to hear, and I'm glad you asked it. So I had a chance to have insight into this question and his answer. I'm sorry to hear that what he thinks about is his continuing delusion. He never gets away from it. And if he's isolating, he goes back to that delusion, which is um, a scary one. And now that he's on clozapine, a really good antipsychotic for him and many other people, he doesn't, I thought he'd kind of ditched it, but no, it's still there when he's by himself and he's ruminating. And I asked him, um, you know, what do you do when you're frustrated about that? And he said, um, I just think I don't have time for this. <laughs> I don't have time for this. I don't want to have be thinking about this delusion. I don't want to have a, an attack where I need to take extra meds because of how I'm feeling. So that was his answer. And then the part about um, the recovery, he, he is, thinks it's important that he's working, he works part-time, that he has friends, that he's got a great psychiatrist, he's taking really good medications now. And he's like you, he really appreciates his family and friends. So I think what you've been telling us for this whole program is actually he boiled down in his answer. So I appreciated that you asked those questions. And so I had that conversation with my son. So thank you, Ryan. That's that's incredible. It's it's, um, that's amazing to hear someone else who uh, is succeeding. And um, if your sons ever want to get in touch with me, uh, they're more than welcome to. I'll send you guys. Well, Randy has my email. Yeah. And have your I wish you could meet in person. I wish all of our sons could meet in person because yeah. my son never got into social media. He's, he doesn't do that. So he has to meet people in person. Yeah. Um, if there's ever an opportunity or if there's a meeting, uh, something where I can attend and within driving range, I, I would love to. I'd love to meet your sons. That my son writes a lot. He writes a lot of poetry. He just, he's having a a tough time where he's living right now because three people got COVID. So, you know, three of his pals, one of whom used to knock on his door every morning and go, Hey Ben, let's go for coffee. They were all isolated. So he's, 
you know, physically isolated. And so he's, I said, have you been spending your time? He said, I just writing, writing, writing. And I don't know what he writes about, but I think that's how he manages extra thoughts. I'll just call them extra thoughts. He gets them on paper. And uh, so I, I know that much. Mimi, anything yeah. to add to that? And then I'll give well, Ryan yeah, a couple of things. Um, Nick too, my son's a, an artist, a visual artist. So he, sometimes he writes and writes in notebooks, ideas for paintings, other times, and this is what he does with his extra thoughts and, um, or else he actually paints. But a lot of time he doesn't paint because it's maybe what's going on in his head is more than he wants to dwell on. Because when you paint, because I'm a painter as well, when you paint, you're really inside of yourself. You know, you're really present. Mm -hmm. And your thoughts are what you're using. So I finally understood that maybe a lot of the time he doesn't want to dwell in that. But what he does then is he will, his sort of um, calming thing is he'll draw in coloring books. Uh, because for him, just moving color across a surface is what he was born to do. And if he can't... <laughs> take on the whole thing of his psyche and his brain and everything that's going on, then he'll sit and he'll draw in coloring books and he'll draw all night long or he'll draw for hours. And that's his way. But Ryan, I was going to say to you also, you know, we all have this wonderful doctor who's in upstate New York or in New York, and he has a whole group of kids and most of them are guys, but with young women too. And in the summertime, um, he does a sort of a, a get together thing where everybody comes. And we went last year. And now, uh, Mindy, that your son is treated by Dr. Layton too, that might be something that you would want to join us this summer, Brian, where you could meet a bunch of kids who are all doing real well because they're all on clozapine and they're all having good, meaningful lives. I think that might be a nice thing for you to join us at. Yeah, I, I would love to. Clozapine sounds. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. Um, clozapine seems to be very effective and for living for living a, a, a more productive life. So that's, that's definitely interesting to me. Um, it has to be administered correctly. So when it's not the answer for everybody, my son hated it. Um, at right now he's on something else. So it's, you know, we, we never want this podcast to be all about Clauserill. If, if so, they would be sponsoring us. So, but it is, it is something, it is an option. Um, so thank you. And I will and send you changer, that website. A life changer for my son, I would say. Yeah. I'm not a commercialist, but in my, in our particular case, it's night and day for Jim. Are you yeah. on Pete Ryan or not? No, he's uh, not. Bill, you're not. Uh, okay. Well, Monique. you're doing well anyway. So obviously other drugs work too. Right. I will, I will send you the website um, just so that you can look and see that they're, you know, even just knowing there are other people. I might just also suggest on Tinder that when you're, if you're revealing that you say something like, I hate to give advice, but I'm going to, you know, um, <laughs> I, I have, I have schizophrenia. It's I, I'm very functional and it's managed with medication. Like just, if you're going to put it up front, put it up front, because if, you know, anyone who's will understand it, we'll know that's a very different animal from untreated schizophrenia. So just a thought, what else in your final minutes would you most like to say to our listeners or to us that we have, you haven't had a chance to cover um, you know, what, what does support look like to you? Anything you want to say, I'm just going to leave it open. Is there anything you want us to understand about you that you haven't had a chance to say? Uh, I continually try to push towards the present. Um, what that means is, um, I think I need to like write down, but <laughs> I, <laughs> Um, the advice that you guys gave today was fantastic. Um, I'd love to be part of a group that is uh, supportive uh, and understanding of me and like you guys and like um, other people with schizophrenia. Um, and yeah, I, I will continue to try to push towards the present. And thank you guys for having me on the podcast today. 
Um, it was a joy. Um, I'm glad to hear that your sons are pushing towards their own uh, sense of the present and normalcy and love and purpose and joy and all, all the good things in life. Um, so thank you for having me today. And we're all smiling if everyone can't see us on the podcast. I think Ryan can see us. We just can't yeah. see him. So you, I think you can feel the love. And if you are listening out there and you are feeling like Ryan and maybe you have schizophrenia and you're listening to our podcast, I know there's a few people that comment on YouTube you know, feel free to put something in the comments or to write to me. Uh, you know, my, our emails are at the end of every podcast. You can get in touch with any one of us and say, you know, I, I also have schizophrenia and feel like I need a community. And we can, we can pass that information on to you, Ryan, if you want, or maybe we'll even do a show where three or four people with schizophrenia come on. I mean, we would love to be We'll just stay in the background and let you guys talk to each other. That would be, it's just, just an idea, but you know, we want to, yeah. we want to be a, a, a conduit for you to get some support, Ryan, as well. And we just so appreciate your being here today. And um, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. Check out International Clubhouse in the area. That's when we had the guest on. Uh, that's the director of that. And just today I was talking with people in Minnesota. We're working on starting one in my area. So check out if there's one in your area. That's a I, great to meet people like yourself. I will. I love that episode. You guys did. I like, I was, he, whoever uh, was the guest did a fantastic job of um, making me feel less alone. I was like, I want to, I want to, I want to be a part of something like that. So I, let, I will definitely look into clubhouses for sure. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. And Thank you. thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.